Hey everyone, welcome back to FPL Fran. Today's video is going to be the match day three cheat sheet. Now, obviously due to the sort of time constraints of creating a video like this, I still haven't watched the final day of games for match day two. So that means I haven't been able to watch Belgium or Portugal, two teams that I think we do want to target quite heavily within the final match day. However, I think what's nice about Belgium, of course, is because they lost their first fixture, we can probably see a very similar strong lineup in match day three, depending on their result in match day two. As far as Portugal, them, them potentially winning this fixture in match day two could completely change our understanding of them as a team. And I do think that it might make us a little bit wary going for Portuguese players. And you know, when we talk about Portuguese players later on in the video, we have to sort of discuss them with expectations that they might actually not be fruitful options. Like for example, Cristiano Ronaldo could be rotated in my opinion, particularly given his age. Someone like Cancelo might be given a bit of rest as well. Although I think he's, he's, he's obviously someone who's very likely to play most games. So is Bruno. Now, as far as some, some other players like for example Spain. Spain have actually qualified first within their group so there are no real issues with them in terms of whether they need to fight for the game compared to let's say Germany who clearly do still need to fight for first place because they're against Switzerland who have four points in their group whereas Germany have six. Now Germany have been split out from from the cheat sheet. What I've done for the German players is I've chosen all the German players that I like and I've moved all the German players into a German cheat sheet and I'll talk about my favorite players regardless of rotation right. So we'll just talk about if, if these players for starters who I like the most from the German national team because we're probably going to maximize with three German players anyways. Now starting off the midfielders I think the most important thing to mention is that it really depends on whether you're wild carding using a limitless or potentially just continuing to use two free transfers. In the budget positions obviously you have to sort of evaluate these players as more budget players. I'm not saying they're the absolute best but for this sort of price point I think I still think they're absolutely elite. Sancho is interesting obviously this is Romania's leading goal scorer throughout the sort of qualification process for Romania and ultimately we did see obviously a great man of the match performance within match day one Ukraine I still haven't watched the performance in match day two obviously versus Belgium we'll see what happens uh, but match day three of course is a nicer fixture versus a Slovakia team who now have something to fight for because they unfortunately lost to Ukraine in match day two so now that makes this entire group in flux anyways which I think is very nice just means that all the teams have something to play for as far as Hoiberg I think he's interesting much easier fixture compared to England and if anything he's been very effectual in this tournament he's also been very strong in terms of the ball recovery aspects of the game so he is your classic sort of uh defensive mid archetype who, who of course is going to be quite relevant for this stage i've also taken out unfortunately a lot of the swiss players because i'm not i'm still expecting that germany will go with a very strong squad and i'm still expecting germany to do well so a lot of the swiss players have been removed for that reason uh hoiberg on the other hand actually has a pretty good fixture compared to of course you know what was the previous match day in england where he still did amazing as far as these six million players we're looking at Arda Guler here and of course Turkey now finally have a strong fixture much stronger fixture at least you know in, in, in hindsight of course with Czech Republic here or Czechia Arda Guler of course established himself I would say within game one from an international level of course a huge performance there with a, a great finish of course you can argue that he probably wasn't that impactful in the overall game but you you can tell that he was a very decisive player even for example as a Real Madrid fan uh, I can tell you with his limited substitutions within the season, he showed great ball striking, which of course you saw within the first goal. Uh, but in general, of course, he's a man of moments. And I'm assuming, of course, that if Turkey lose to Portugal, that he's going to be a very important pick for match day three, potentially, as long as he gets to start. And I really think that he should continue starting. Vitinha is an interesting one. For me, I would only go for Vitinha if, if Portugal's place within this group is within flux. If you see, for example, within some of the friendlies, there are some squads that Portugal can sort of field out that unfortunately have Vitinha blocked or, or rather benched and so Vitinha is only really a pick that I would go for if Portugal were more likely to go with the full strength team he's a very good pick at a very very outrageous price point in my opinion I still think Portugal is a strong team despite the rather lackluster showing in match day one and he's a very key part of that Portuguese midfield even though he plays a little bit deeper I would say compared to let's say a Bruno Conte once again great performances two man of the matches in a row there's nothing else that really needs to be said i think it, it's clear france play very defensively which is a little bit shocking but this has also sort of been i i, I guess the the nature of deschamps uh tenure he's been always safe prioritizing i would say risk averseness than than let's say uh risk seeking us and and what i will say about Conte is that one of the issues with going for triple France within a limitless or a wild card is it is actually quite tough to pick three France players because I think outside of Mbappe and Teo Hernandez, you know, Conte might actually be the most interesting French player to go for because it's 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 not like, for example, Dembele is that effectual when it comes to goals and assists. It's not like anyone else within the team is that interesting as well uh, as a pick to go for unless you want to double up on the defense. So I do think Conte potentially could be the third best 
uh, French pick regardless, particularly if you're not going to go with Griezmann, right? I, I can understand going for Gr Griezmann, Mbappe, and Teo Hernandez. That's probably the optimal triple up, but that also takes you away from a lot of the forward positions as well. And you might not want Griezmann potentially for that game. But I still think, of course, it's such a good game versus Poland. You still might want the two of them. And of course, maybe Kante will lose out for that reason. In the 6.5 million position, this is interesting because I think we have a lot of options. Uh, Ayose Perez is, is interesting for me because... He had a brilliant small, small showing versus Italy. And also within the just within the sort of nature of, of his relationship with the Spanish squad right now, I mean, he was someone who was a surprise call-up, first of all. He was, however, included in the friendlies and involved. And once again, as I have to say, he had a great sort of involvement versus Italy coming off at, or coming on rather at 70 minutes and playing uh, a very strong 15 minutes, even cracking a great shot and, and even creating a lot of solo opportunities where he was dribbling through multiple defenders. I really think that as a Spaniard, we are going to fully rotate because I think we have a lot of young players that, that should get as much rest as possible. I can see, for example, a Lamine Yamal, a Nico Williams coming off the bench more so than I would see them starting in match day three. I might be wrong, but this is my sentiment. Uh, Rodri himself got suspended, so he won't play. So Zubi Mendy will play for us. And Mikel Merino, for example, will probably play in the midfield alongside him because I do think Fabian probably deserves a rest as well. Now, if that happens, I also think that the defense will get fully rotated. And we'll talk about that later on the defensive section. But I do think that our front line is most likely going to be Ayose Perez, Oyarzabal, and Ferran Torres. That is the front line that I would expect. Now, you could obviously expect Jose Lu as well, but I do think that we use Jose Lu and we utilize Jose Lu almost like a white horse type player. He's someone who is always ready for most of the occasions, particularly as being a super sub. And I don't really think that he necessarily needs to start match day three. I do think that the forwards that I mentioned are going to start. Now, in the 10 position, that Pedri position, I do think it's between Dani Olmo and Alex Baena. And for that reason, I don't think I want to suggest who I think is definitely going to start. I think it, it might be Olmo, it might be Baena, and I just don't think it's worth the gamble particularly on match day three, when you want to just make the, the correct gamble for players that you really think will start. I think Ayothe will start, and that's very interesting. Baumgartner, he had a brilliant performance, and we talked about Baumgartner in the previous video, so nothing has really changed. He had a man-of-the-match performance in the previous match. I think Sabitzer also played a brilliant game too, and arguably, if let's say Sabitzer was able to score a goal, you know, he probably steals man-of-the-match. But both these midfielders for Austria play a very pivotal role for the team. Sabitzer starts out wide, but he moves into a 10 position. Baumgartner effectively is playing as an out and out 10. Relationships don't really change too much depending on the Austrian center forward. Although I will mention that the one thing that has happened in match day two is that Arnautovic actually started the game. So he took penalties over Sabitzer. Usually I expect that Sabitzer takes pen penalties over Gregoric, who is the the, mid the forward rather, who's been actually starting most games for Austria. Now, because Arnautovic actually started that game. I think that's why Sabitzer didn't actually get penalties. Whereas I think in other situations, particularly with Arnautovic at his age, I'm not sure if he's going to start the next game. So I think with Austria rotating potentially once again, that makes Sabitzer a little bit more interesting for, for the Dutch team uh, matchup that they have. The issue, of course, for Austria, despite the match being a very strong team, in my opinion, is unfortunately... You know, the Dutch are a strong team and you can see how defensively robust they are, as you could see in the French game. So that's quite a tough thing. As far as McTominay, I, get, I think he does deserve a rise. It's a much easier fixture. The position that you can see him taking up for Scotland is absolutely ridiculous. Some of the historical stats internationally for McTominay, I think, are not reflective of the change in role that he's had within the national team. So if you look at his role, for example, within the previous match versus Switzerland, I thought he was very effectual, always in the box, always a set-piece threat. McGinn is also another player that I quite like, but to be honest, I still prefer McTominay for the goal threat, and that's why McTominay is, is here now as the yellow option. As far as Chalhanoglu, I do think that he will play a very illustrative role, but a deeper role for the team. So his man of the match potential is always going to be one of those situations where if, if you continue to see him do well, it, it really is a case of Chalhanoglu, for example, controlling the game and getting a very similar man of the match to some, some someone like uh, Granit Xhaka, who, who got man of the match uh, at one point in the group stages, if you guys remember. So I do like Chalhanoglu, but I also think that because there are other players playing in front of him, because the game is probably going to be a both teams to score type game, I do think that it, it probably would, would suit you more to pick goal scorers like potentially Arda Guler. And for that reason, I, I, I still think that Chalhanoglu is probably an option I'd pass up on slightly um, at this stage. Although he is a penalty taker for the team, and as you can see finally within the tournament, uh, being a penalty taker does matter, and we could see that with Arnautovic. As far as the 7 million price bracket, and I think we have a lot of great options here once again. Eriksen, of course, him and Soboslai are probably the ones that are most interesting because I think they're clear talismans for their teams. Sobo finally has a great fixture versus Scotland. I think 
if if I have to be completely honest, I thought Scotland, you know, they deserve the draw versus Switzerland. And I think Switzerland were, were playing, you know, pretty poorly, to be honest. But the chances that Scotland gave away were, were, were quite plentiful. And, and I do think that Sobo has an opportunity once again to have a great performance. I thought he played actually arguably better versus Germany. And he actually got some pretty good chances within the game, or at least the hung, hung, Hungarian team did. So I think the, the idea that Sobo can play versus a weaker opponent, which will probably lead to more opportunities, like for example, direct free kicks uh, corners penalties the like i do think sobo is actually a very interesting pick for limitless match day three and clearly hungary still have something to play for in terms of trying to um, at least potentially secure that third place slot that will allow them to progress within the tournament ericsson for the same reason i think is is brilliant a much more muted performance versus england but i think this is this is sort of the the case of styles sort of make matchups right where if you look at for example a game that was a little bit easier to be fair compared to the England one on paper, I suppose, where they drew versus Slovenia. I, I do think that Ericsson's probably going to have a little bit more of an impactful performance given the advanced position that he has for Denmark, given what, what he has access to from the intangibles in terms of free kicks and, and all that sort. So I do like Ericsson a, a lot as a pick, and I think he definitely rises for this. And I think, once again, a very interesting pick for match day three, Limitless. Uh, with Oyar Sabal, in my opinion, he's probably the most lethal Spain pick out of all the rotation players because I, I do think that he will, first of all, start within a center forward position. I think that it is more likely than not that we will see Oyar Sabal actually play in place of Morata as a starting center forward within the team. And another thing to mention is Oyar Sabal, historically within Spain and the Spanish national team, actually has the best penalty record, right, within a domestic level. He has a very consistent record. Jose Lu, for example, is someone who is 20 and 9 with penalties. That's a very, very shambolic record. Uh, Ferran Torres doesn't have much experience with penalties. He's already missed one out of four. Oyar Sabal has a much cleaner, much stronger record. And I do think that if, let's say, the rotated Spanish lineup will come out, which, I, which I, as I said, is probably going to be that trident, you know, aided by either the 10 of Baena or, let's say, Dani Olmo, I do think Oyasaba will take penalties. Another point to mention, of course, is Ferran Torres, of course, is a forward, so you need to sort of decide what you'd like to have. I think Oyasaba, because he's a midfielder, is probably going to be close to being a lock in my living list. As far as the 8 to 8.5 million price bracket, Trossard for me, I do think he drops. I'm not sure, of course, whether he starts for match day two. I think there were some doubts, of course, after a pretty subdued performance in match day one, where, of course, he was involved in opportunities, but also didn't make the most out of them. There are obviously other options within the team that can actually play ahead of Trossard, potentially Bakayoko, for example. I don't know what's going to happen in match day two. Potentially, uh, I'm assuming that Trossard will start again uh, with some doubts over that. And because there are some doubts over that, I don't really know how that will carry forward over to match day three. Another thing to mention, too, I think is still within sort of our understanding of things, maybe we still think that Ukraine is a very strong team. They put in a much better performance in match day two. And I'm, I'm expecting Trossard to be less appetizing of a pick at the same time as well. If we think that we're going for something like a limitless strategy, it's very unlikely that Trossard would actually end up in my drafts because I'm, I'm more than likely going to favor someone like KDB. As far as the 8.5 million price bracket, no real changes here. I still think that Saka is definitely going to start for match day three for England. I still think that he's probably been their most effectual sort of non-Harry Kane attacker, someone who actually still at least is driving at the defense consistently. Uh, I'm not really quite sure why he always gets subbed off quite early. I think it's it's slightly odd given the fact that he's one of the few players continuing to tr sort of make plays throughout the game. But Saka, of course, has been very effectual for England. And I do think, of course, once again, the, the matchup is, is on paper um, a lot better for England. And, and hopefully, of course, Saka will have better opportunities. As far as the sort of premium price bracket, no changes there as well. I do think that with Foden... There's always opportunities where he can be an, a little bit of an earlier sub as well compared to, let's say, Bellingham, who I think his minutes are a little bit more assured within the team. So I, I haven't really changed my mind on Foden, even though his performance uh, versus Denmark was a marked step up versus match day one. So I'm not going to sort of constantly change my opinion on Foden right now. I still think I'd probably prefer Saka and Bellingham. But right now, of course, I still think Foden's an interesting pick. And, and it's more than likely, of course, that we'll see him start match day three once again. Moving on to the forwards, the only real changes in the budget positions is that we have two Hungarian options, and that's simply because they're against Scotland. These are players who, of course, are, are rather nailed within the team and also have you know decent records. Varga, of course, is the out-and-out -out sort of center forward. Salai is just another sort of attacker within the system. Um, and Sobo, of course, sort of plays a, a little bit more of a flexible role, uh, a little bit more of a freer role, which allows him to roam flanks, but also sort of move throughout the midfield and, and, and do what he, he likes to do within the midfield and, and within the structure of the team as they try to sort of collapse. 
as far as let's say why you'd want to go for these options, I, I probably would still pass up on them, right? Ultimately, within a wild card, I think I still would go for the premium forwards. And and honestly, the cheapest forward I think I would really stick with is, is Ferran Torres um, at 7.5 million. But I still think, of course, there's going to be a doubt there, right? Some people might not trust the fact that Ferran Torres might start for Spain. And I can completely understand if you have that sort of sentiment where you're not sure whether Ferran Torres will start. And as I said, in my opinion, I think that because of the position Spain find themselves in, they have plenty of opportunity to rotate. With my experience watching Luis de la Fuente as well, he's not the type of manager where in friendlies he'll sort of throw one to two players and, and, and you know, allow, let's say, um, maybe a, a strong Spanish team to, to play and then have maybe two or three rotations. He usually does full rotation or he has no rotation. That's that's what I've seen historically. He's happy to do early substitutions and that's mostly because the early substitutions apply to the youngest player, younger players within the team who are sort of playing 60, 70 minutes bursts uh, at a time, but sort of playing at, at a full tilt. And, and that obviously means that they probably need to be subbed off to sort of ma maintain the intensity of the match. And that's what he spoke about discussing the substitutions that he made within the Italian game. And I think that's very fair. I think on the flip side here you have to think about how important the game is for albania and how you know spain's position within the group is secure in my opinion there's no need to put anyone in harm's way i think it makes sense that ferran torres will start in the right wing position uh, and of course he's a little bit more flexible as a player now of course the young players can come on and step on and, and that can be interesting but you just have to be fair as well and i think spain for example the goal share is very very strong um within these fixtures here so i don't really mind ferran torres at all if you want to go for a limitless at the seven million price point quickly going back to that though i do think that you have differentials right ultimately these are easier matchups on paper for belgium and definitely for let's say Schick from from Czechia and then Mitrovic from Serbia. That's all I have to say. I think Mitrovic had a great performance in the previous match, even though he actually wasn't, you know, unfortunately the goal scorer within the, the previous game as well uh, versus Slovenia. But once again, I think Mitrovic is someone who is very likely going to play in match day three because that, that game is so important for Serbia because they, it's it's effectively must win. And I, I feel like it's, it's hard to believe that Mitrovic wouldn't play the full match. As far as Schick, I do think his minutes have been a little bit dubious particularly of course given his injury history as well so i i do think that he's not as elite an option potentially even in match day three and that's simply why i, I don't have him as a green pick and doku of course unfortunately you know winger archetype maybe a slightly tougher fixture for belgium as well maybe we've also potentially overrated belgium previously uh but obviously as a bit more of a winger archetype less of a center forward we, we expect less goal share and unfortunately when you're placed in the forward position you know not benefiting so much uh for a winger as far as, let's say, the 7.5 million position, going back to Ferran Torres, I do think Depay and Gakpo continue to be sort of, you know, key players for the Dutch team. Depay is on a, a lot of different sort of set pieces, right? He was on corners at multiple points within the French game. He was also on direct free kicks, although none of them were really good. Uh, Gakpo, however, his minutes just look really solid within the Dutch team. And I do think that he'll continue to have solid minutes because it's very cl clear that he's imposed himself as a top player within that attack. And I do think that he's going to stay within the team and that's going to be very huge. Um, as far as Hoyland, I think I just haven't really been too impressed with his within his role within Denmark. I think both him and Wynn are open to sort of early substitutions. And I'm just overall not that in enticed by, by Hoyland, un unfortunately. So that sort of leaves him to being a differential. As far as how good the fixtures are, uh, for France, I do believe that Griezmann has an incredible fixture. The issue, of course, is how you're going to pick once again the three forwards. I think Kane is very likely going to start once again um, versus Slovenia. I think Griezmann's most likely going to start. I mean, he has an sort of imperious record with France, you know, not missing games in a row. But of course, I think I believe at one of the international breaks, he, he was injured, unfortunately, and had to miss one of the games. But, you know, for the most part, we always see Griezmann play. And that's why he's going to be a great option, uh, given the fact that the fixture is a lot nicer right now versus a Polish team who unfortunately, you know, technically have nothing to play for. As far as, let's say, a Ronaldo and Mbappe, I, I do think that once again, the question about Mbappe is whether he needs to be played. I think France have actually a very strong position within the group uh, because of the nature of the results. Austria won today versus Poland. However, France have a, a better head to head. And then obviously they drew versus the Dutch. So, you know, in most cases, France will, will advance safe and sound probably as first place i don't really know whether mbappe needs to be used because he wasn't used utilized tonight in a game where they definitely could have tried to fight for a win i think versus the dutch uh, and that wasn't done by mbappe or of course the champs and so i do think that mbappe's uh, potential appearance in match day three is a little bit of a doubt and and until we get better news of that i do think that mbappe is someone that i probably might actually pass up on on the limitless and i'd probably rather go for griezmann instead if the news on mbappe isn't good now of course if the news is, is on the flip side i'd probably go for mbappe over griezmann 
As far as Ronaldo, I, I think, as I said, there's a prime situation here where, of course, if Portugal do well in match day two, that you should really be resting Ronaldo in match day three and getting him as fit as possible for match day four. That's my personal opinion. I think, you know, considering the age factor, even though the fixture is just amazing for Portugal. So in this situation, I think Goncalo Ramos is, is someone who's going to be very interesting, obviously, if we expect for Ronaldo to rotate. So that's something to to look into. However, the, the only thing with Goncalo is that, you know, penalties will obviously be, be given back to Bruno Fernandes, and that just makes him even better as a pick for match day three, because I do think Bruno is, is this type of player who's unlikely to miss games. So I think even though Ronaldo might be someone who could, who, who could be rested, um, it's more than likely that someone like Bruno would play. And I do think it's it may, may be, of course, if I'm predicting that the Spanish national team is going to fully rotate, that maybe the Portuguese team will do the same. But I also think that it might not be, you know, Roberto Martinez's natural sort of idea to rotate the full squad. And I think that because he's he, he likes to sort of tinker with different formations, he's potentially a manager who wants to try something different within match day three, as opposed to Luis de la Fuente, who I think clearly has a set 11 and clearly has a B team as well, which is totally fine because the substitutions from the B team from the Spanish national team are very set. Uh, they're very structured, and I think they're very much like for like, whereas obviously Portugal sort of move between an, an array of different lineups. Like um, you can see them playing back threes, back fours, and, you know, there, there are different sort of formations where you sort of see the fullbacks playing different roles within the pitch as well, given the fact that they have some pretty world-class fullbacks. And, and that's all I'll say about Portugal. So for me, I am not that high on Goncalo because of the lack of pens. And, and, and also, I think just once again, lower probably estimations for you know how well he's going to perform particularly if portugal have to rotate uh given that we haven't seen too much i think sort of free-flowing attacking football from portugal if we're being completely honest so far as far as let's say mbappe and kane obviously i've discussed mbappe of kane i think he does start if i was to really pick my favorite three forwards for limitless it, it really might actually still be potentially lukaku uh, Mbappe and Kane but I can understand as I said people going for Ferran Torres as well and also I can understand people just doubling up on France as well assuming that France is going to play Mbappe and Griezmann and that's actually quite an interesting sort of fixture to go for because in theory France still have something to fight for when it comes to coming out of that group as the first place team whereas you know teams like Portugal teams like England potentially um, have a little bit more of a stronger hold over their groups uh, so far. As far as the euro defense positions I, I think one of the tough things to to talk about here is first of all you know we can go back to clean sheet odds i think that's that's you know a very helpful stat and then second of all is just the, the natural meta of this tournament to recognize the ball recoveries have become absolutely insane so i think you know there have been more center backs introduced to this list but i will also say that kukurea broke i think the at least the record so far for this euros with 15 ball recoveries for spain so it's not necessarily the case that only center backs can get ball recoveries. I think DeMarco, for example, within the Spanish game as well, on the flip side, uh, the other left back in the game also got eight ball recoveries. So in my opinion, just to sort of set the, the argument straight or, or the tone straight, I, I do think that fullbacks are still amazing. Middlestad, for example, showed why that is the case, in my opinion, within the game uh, Germany just recently played versus Hungary. You know, we still expect attacking fullbacks to produce attacking returns. So it's not that likely, for example, that center backs will always completely outscore fullback, you know, through their sort of ball recovery stats because fullbacks are also capable of doing ball recovery. So what we've taken here, of course, is we, we've always consistently looked at ball recoveries from players within you know, their respective teams. Sometimes, of course, when it bears out the games, it's completely different and center backs do seem to be doing very well within the Euros. So we've given a little bit of respect to that as well. Uh, phase, of course, at a ridiculous price point for Belgium, I still think is very interesting, particularly for the final match day, particularly if you want to target, let's say, a Belgium team that definitely has something to fight for still. And then at the sort of differential price point at 4 million, I think I've got Akaiden from Turkey, who, of course, is f facing the Czech team. He had a lot of ball recoveries in the first game, played very well defensively versus Kvartselia. However, of course, I haven't seen Turkey play versus Portugal. So maybe by the time Turkey plays versus Portugal, we'll see once again another pretty weak defensive performance from Turkey and we'll be completely switched off from them. But he is someone that I'm more, mostly just looking at as a ball recovery sort of uh, magnet. As far as Reishu here or, or Ratu, uh, um, apologies, of course, for the pronunciation. He was actually, you know, an interesting I would say within the Romanian game versus Ukraine. That's what we have so far in in terms of watching within the Euro specifically. But of course, he, he is someone who I, I don't expect to be, you know, someone who's consistently producing attacking opportunities uh, for Romania. Because obviously, if you look at the game uh, in, in, in hindsight, of course, with the U Ukraine, it's not like Romania had a lot of the ball. 
They were sort of playing quite defensive and very organized, of course, making a lot of great last ditch tackles and actually closing off goal scoring opportunities for Ukraine, which was probably a little bit of a difference from, let's say, the Slovakia game as well, which I think was much more open, you know, between Slovakia and Ukraine today. So I do think he's interesting just because of the price point, because the ball recovery numbers are very strong. And of course, the XGI is actually quite strong as well as a fullback. So um, from that perspective, particularly since he will be a, a huge part of the defensive effort, I do think that he's a decent pick as well as a differential. In the 4.5 position, I do like Wehi a lot. Uh, the ball recovery numbers so far have been absolutely trumping uh, John Stones, and that's also why I've dropped John Stones later down in the list. I think obviously his position is within the team is locked. The clean sheet odds are pretty good for England. Uh, and obviously, as, as someone who's good at ball recoveries, you can't really go wrong with, with the, the combination of both as a logic to pick a player. Inathio, I think, you know, the, the weird thing, of course, is that I actually thought Inathio would probably actually play in match day one, but actually Pepe was preferred over him. And, and I don't think Pepe necessarily put a foot wrong in that game. Uh, but it's obviously just weird that, you know, you, you, you don't have, let's say, a young promising talent like maybe Antonio Silva or Goncalo Gonca Inacio, who is actually sort of playing ahead of Pepe, um, at least, you know, in their stages of their careers and, and, and what they could sort of produce for the national team going forwards. Clearly, of course, Roberto Martinez respects a lot the experience, I think, of players like Pepe and, and Ronaldo. And that that's fine. I think uh, that makes Goncalo Inacio, I still, still think, someone who actually gets a rise because I still think that he's going to sort of insert himself into the starting 11. I do think Pepe will also get rest so I do think it's very likely that he actually plays and in this fixture here versus Georgia, which is actually really good. Califuri, I think, is basically here just as a very sort of good price point for a ball recovery player. And also, I have to say that Croatia have been, you know, pretty unimpressive. If you look at the ball recovery notes for Califuri as well, within all the players within the 4 to 4.5 price point, even including the 5 million price point, his ball recovery numbers are elite. Um, so that's why I think he still deserves to be a differential if you really want to pick sort of an Italian defender on that sort of basis. Now, keep in mind, of course, Croatia clearly has something to to play for, and that makes a huge difference, I think, in the situation of Califuri, where unfortunately the fixture is a little bit more even compared to some of the other ones. As far as the 5 million price point, though, I think Nuno Mendes has to rise. I do think I do think slightly we're starting to see that he might be preferred to Dallo. Now, I haven't watched, as I said, Portugal versus Turkey match day two. My gut feeling here might be completely wrong. And, and I do think it's interesting that he was allowed to play sort of a center back position, but he can also play effectively a left back role for the team. And that, you know, when there was an opportunity to sub off one of Nuno Mendes or Dallo, that actually Dallo was the player who came off. And that might just be because maybe Roberto Martinez actually prefers Cancelo a, a, as a bit more of a sort of center mid, um, which he sort of played for most of the game or, you know, a right back, which he sort of played near the end of the game as far as Grimaldo for me he's a new option of course a fantastic option at this point because as I said I'm expecting Spanish rotation I think both Carvajal and Cucurea our fullbacks will rotate uh, Nacho Fernandez is an interesting one and I put an asterisk over him as well because in my opinion Nacho should also rotate with Laporte who seemed like he was pretty gassed by the end of match day two However, of course, Nacho has reportedly, you know, suffered an injury within training. So maybe he might not be rushed to actually play within the match versus Albania because he might not be ready for the match. I do think Vivian from, you know, Bilbao will also play for us. So maybe if you're looking towards a Spanish option, a center back who hasn't actually featured within the tournament yet, um, he could be one option, of course, because, of course, that will give you access more likely to ball recoveries. Although, of course, what, what we've seen so far from Kukrea is that you can absolutely do it as a fullback. However, as I said, I do think that Grimaldo will come into the team for match day three for Spain. I think that this is a good chance to rotate Kukurea. He takes a lot more set pieces than Kukurea, that's for sure. I think he will take left-sided corners. I also think that he'll take potential, potentially some direct free kicks, which will more than likely just be sort of crossing opportunities for him based on what I've seen from him with, within the international friendlies for Spain. I do think Grimaldo, you, you, we have to be a little bit more tempered with him. Obviously, the goal assist numbers for Bayer Leverkusen are, are insane. The expected goal and involvement numbers are also insane but clearly i think the role that he plays for spain within a back four is completely different and i think we have to have slightly more muted expectations for him although he is a clearly world-class sort of attacking fullback and going to be an interesting option for this match day as far as demarco i think he deserves a rise as well you know for me he still looks like a very attacking player for italy now of course he played versus a, a team in spain that completely destroyed italy you know from a tactical perspective and just all over the pitch so i really don't think that reflects too much on demarco he was still moving into advanced positions when he could and i still think he'll continue to do so within the final match day i think he clearly is you know the more preferential attacking option uh, and if you look at for example maybe how weak i suppose the, the the right flank is right now for italy with Chiesa, definitely dropping a level or two 
compared to what we usually expect based on, you know, if you watched his last performance within the Euros and obviously effectively just his performance in general after his ACL injury. It's very clear that DeMarco sort of carries a lot of that left side attack. And I do think that even versus a team like Croatia, that he's still an interesting option, given the fact that he also does quite a fair bit of ball recoveries as a fullback. Um, so I do like him a lot as an attacking fullback. As far as Stones, as I said, he drops for me. I actually prefer Gwehi because he's probably going to do more ball recoveries. We don't see any of the stuff like Stones moving into the midfield. So I, I have to imagine that their set piece threat is very similar as in between Gwehi uh, and Stones. Clearly Stones, of course, has a little bit more um, expected goals per 90 than, let's say, Gwehi. But you also might have to say that it comes down to, of course, the set piece strength of Man City and Crystal Palace as opposed to their individual sort of prowess at them. As far as Navas, I think that he'll rotate for Carvajal as well. Um, I have just sort of made him yellow because I do think that he's a slightly worse option compared to Grimaldo as an attacking option. Uh, but clearly, I think he's still a very, very good pick. As far as, let's say, Nacho, for me, he's still, as I said, a little bit of a risk. And I think Vivian will actually probably play ahead of him. But I, I've kept Nacho here in case you wanted to sort of think about him as an option. As far as, let's say, the 5.5 million price point, uh, Guardiol definitely has dropped. Guardiol has dropped into that, that yellow tier because I think either he plays a left back role and you know, he plays very attacking and he can be a very interesting attacking threat, which I've seen within the friendlies for Croatia leading up to the tournament and then also uh, within match day one. Less so within Forte match day two, where he was sort of forced to play center back so that they can try the sort of Parisish experiment, which in my opinion sort of failed. I think that Guardiol looked much better on the left back positions from what I can see. I think that he might go back to the left back position and I think it's very possible that he can be very interesting in that left back position. Uh, but beyond that, of course, you can see that you know the historical numbers for the for sort of national team are completely different to sort of the historic the sort of goal assist numbers for Man City. And part of that, of course, is that you know his his immersion to the sort of left wing left back hybrid role within football is completely new. So uh, in my opinion, I've already seen a little bit of, with Croatia, and I think that if he can play there in that final match day, he's going to be much more effective as an option. Uh, as far as Teo Hernandez, given the fact that France still have something to fight for, I think he's going to be very interesting. Much more muted performance once again versus Netherlands, but I think that's also part partially because, you know, as a tactical tool, I, I think Frimpong was used to sort of, you know, play as someone who could run in behind that sort of French defense, and it made more sense for Hernandez to play a bit more of a defensive role to sort of manage Frimpong and his runs in behind. And you could actually see uh, the sort of one-on-one -on -one duels that that Frimpong and Hernandez had uh, in terms of that. And I think he contributed a lot defensively today, Hernandez, that is. Uh, whereas with Poland, I think there's much more opportunity for him to sort of play much more advanced positions and to make that sort of uh, bombarding run as well, whether it's diagonal, um, straight into the box, or obviously a sort of overlapping run. And it also depends on whether Mbappe comes on as well. Because I think the French national team played a lot much more through the right-hand side today. Uh, then the left one, for example, they had Mbappe sort of shifting towards the left at times in match day one. As far as Walker, still think he's obviously going to start match day three. Clearly, I think there was one point in the game where it seemed like he wasn't maybe fit enough to continue, but we tend to see Walker continue to play on. I just think that they don't really have, you know, a like-for-like -like replacement. I don't think that they'll play Trent right back in match day three. So I, I do think, of course, Walker will continue to play. Um, he's someone who we, alongside with Pickford, expect to have amazing minutes for England. And I don't think that's going to change at all. Obviously, the, the ball recovery numbers are still nice um, and, and his ability to make an overlapping run and, and potentially obviously find himself within assisted position is clearly um, available towards England you know if, if they are able to sort of make use of it so I still think he's a great option given the fact that the clean sheet odds are quite strong for England as far as let's say Dumfries I think he definitely rises as a pick I, I have not added from Pong here because I think he's a little bit dubious um, and so therefore I don't think Frimpong will start match day three. I don't think the experiment necessarily works so well outside of that chance that he got, which was effectively one-on-one -on -one with the keeper, but, you know, pressed behind by um, the French defense. So I do think that, unfortunately, in this situation, Dumfries is probably the option that should start match day three, and maybe Frimpong can get benched once again. And that's pretty much why I've decided, you know, Dumfries is a great option. I still think that, you know, if he plays as a right-back option, that he will be obviously slightly more attacking than Ake, and probably the pick to go for still between the two of them. So that's why I've prioritized Dumfries here. Ake, of course, just right below him as well. Robertson, for me, is a new pick and a differential pick, clearly, because Hungary, of course, you know, have shown to be quite defensively susceptible, but I think also Scotland in general are so attacking. And Robertson clearly plays an attacking role for the team, much more attacking than even his Liverpool role, you know, even from a default position, at least. Maybe, of course, Liverpool are a much better attacking team um, if you want to compare like for like. But um, the fixture here is nice for Robertson. And I do think that, of course, this is a good opportunity to potentially punt on someone who has that sort of nice, unique fixture that a lot of people would be scared to go for as well. As far as, let's say, Mela, similar situation here, where, of course, in match day one, he was probably still being rested, given the fact that he's still coming back from an injury. Um, the fact that he started versus England match day two, we saw Christiansen actually get subbed off at half time. 
uh, not around halftime, so maybe around 50, 60 minutes, definitely pre-60, uh, but Mela st starting to stay on, and obviously this last match for Denmark still being very important, given the fact that they only have two draws within the tournament so far, uh, means that I think Mela will definitely start for Serbia, and I think he can be a very interesting differential pick, and of course, when you look at the historical numbers for the national team, uh, they're absolutely ridiculous, so I do think that he's still going to be a very interesting and good pick to go for. As far as the premium price bracket, um, I still think Cancelo, of course, is completely de depending on, let's say, Portugal's uh, position within the group because this fixture is just a prime fixture uh, effectively you you'd like to go triple portugal if you could but you're also going to struggle and i'm going to struggle as well picking the right three portuguese players i do think that of course if anything happens within the match versus turkey and let's say portugal clearly has something to, to play for within match day three you can tell of course is a, is a brilliant pick versus georgia no matter what van dyke i think also rises we've seen that he's a set piece threat we've seen also that he takes direct free kicks at times uh and i'm sure obviously that's that's you know basically linked to Depay within the team as well. You know, if Depay's on the team, that's probably less avenues to, you know, like miscellaneous points from, from Van Dijk, like penalties, like set pieces and things like that. Um, but yeah, Van Dijk, obviously, still a great pick for Austria. And clearly, I think the Dutch still have something to fight for, given the fact that they can actually get first place within this group if they do beat Austria within um, this match here. As far as Trippier, I think he has to rise because the news about Shaw is actually really poor. I actually thought that Shaw's timeline would be a little bit better based on the sort of initial assessment made by Southgate. But it's clear that Shaw is not very close to being able to start right now. And I think that obviously, given the fact that the clean sheet odds for Slovenia are very good, uh, unfortunately, Trippier isn't, you know, accessing, I suppose, clean, like, like any sort of set piece potential like he does for Newcastle, which makes him, you know, the elite pick that he is. So for me, he's, he's definitely a little bit more subdued. Um, however, obviously, if Trent doesn't start the match, I suppose it could be between Trippier and Foden to take some sort of set pieces, and that could be a, a little bit of an improvement for Trippier as well. So I do think that you know he does rise for this fixture here versus Slovenia. In terms of the goalkeeping positions, the only thing I'll say is that I've sort of allocated it based on price points. So once again, if you want to pick the best clean sheets, I would just do that on a limitless. You don't really need to do anything too exceptional. Obviously, if you want to target you know stronger players from France, from from let's say from Italy, for example, from Spain even, you can pick some of the outfield players instead. But uh, ultimately, I, I do think the fixtures are very strong here for a lot of players. Within the 4 million price point, it's the Romanian player Inita um, and also Stanek within the Ch Czech player here. Obviously, these are tougher fixtures anyways, but you know, at that sort of price point, if you're really looking for sort of a, a cheapening um, of your team and you're trying to sort of maximize the 100 million budget, if you're, let's say, using a wild card, I can understand going for these sorts of goalkeepers on match day three. Um, and the 4.5 million price point, I do think Verbruggen definitely deserves to be there. The Dutch put in a very strong performance versus France in match day two. I don't think they'll be necessarily as cautious in match day three. And I think Austria also have ultimately performed really well within the tournament so far. But because all these teams have something to fight for, and the Dutch are still going to be, I think, you know, setting up in a similar sort of manner. For Bruggen, for me, is still an interesting option. Gulaxi is here, of course. Gulaxi gets to face a, a, a Scotland team that's, you know, a lot weaker compared to, I think, the other two opponents, if we're being completely fair. But I'd still class him as a differential, maybe under Verbruggen. As far as the 5 million price point, uh, Pickford and Costa, I think, are, are the standout picks for sure. Castiles have dropped a bit because I think our estimations of the Belgium defense have dropped a little bit generally. Uh, unfortunately, just from the one game sample size within the tournament, but then also just, I think, in terms of the, just the setup that we've seen so far from Tedesco as well. Um, Raya and Simon. Uh, or when I Simon, of course, I, I think the only thing I'll mention here is that I do think that when I Simon is carrying a wrist injury from Spain. And so because I expect massive rotation and because I've seen many friendlies anyways where we, we've rotated our keepers, which is not actually very common uh, compared to other national teams, I do think that we'll see potential Raya starting uh, in match day three. And I think I would avoid, honestly, taking on that sort of punt at all costs. I'd much rather go for players I think are more nailed to be rotating. But in this situation, as I said, I, I do think it's it's not really worth going for either, even though the fixture is so amazing uh, for the Spanish goalkeepers. And then with Magnan and Donnarumma, I think they're good fixtures. Croatia, of course, is going to be a much tougher fixture but I think that Croatia could, could have something to fight for. So when you talk about safe potential for still uh, a very strong defense and a very good goalkeeper as well, a very good shot stopper, as you can see here, you know, the most saves per 90 as well compared to all of these other keepers. I do think Donnarumma is still an excellent choice uh, for match day three, and I really have no complaints as well. Um, I think he put in a very good performance versus Spain, and he probably was one of the key reasons for why they didn't concede more. Part of that, of course, is the finishing of Spain as well. But yeah, I think this is a goalkeeper, and this is the sort of, main positional cheat sheet for match day three in terms of germany now quickly moving on to that starting with the defense i i've basically anticipated let's say we see someone like schlotterbeck come in 
um, or obviously if, if Rom or Henrik's come in within the fullback positions for Germany. I still think Middlestadt is my favorite uh, defender to go for. Then it's Schlotterbeck because I think his ball recovery numbers are just much better than Rudiger uh, and even Ta, for example. So I would definitely sort of prioritize these players in that sort of order. Um, if you're on Limitless, obviously I'd probably just go um, Middlestadt still, to be honest, over Rudiger. So that's how I would go about it. Schlotterbeck, really good for the ball recoveries, but Middlestadt clearly with the attacking potential uh, makes him a little bit better as a pick for me. As far as the sort of midfield, or, or rather the forward price point, I'd rather go full Krug over Havertz, particularly if full Krug starts. And yeah, ultimately within this situation, I still think that Havertz is going to start. It seems like the, the sort of news around Germany is that they will actually not rotate and that they will actually play the same team. Uh, but that, once again, calls to question you know, whether Havertz is going to be an interesting pick because he might be an early substitution. So for me, I, I think I'm not that high within the, the forwards within Germany overall. Um, I think I'm definitely a little bit more leaning towards going for the sort of midfielders from Germany, just because at least if you're getting the goal scored, if you're getting reduced minutes, um, you're probably going to benefit a little bit more for being a midfielder. For me, I like Musial the most right now in terms of all the midfield picks and then Sané and then Gundogan. I think they're all great picks. Of course, in the midfield, I would prioritize once again, a, a defender or a double midfield and or let's say two defenders and uh, one midfielder from Germany. I don't think you can really go wrong with any of the options. Obviously, Gundo had a great performance in match day two, but keep in mind, of course, Musial has been super consistent. And then Sani, of course, if he gets to start, even though he is so erratic as a player, um, at least, you know, unfortunately with this sort of season of his career, I still think that he is so effective and so uh, direct that he's always going to create opportunities for himself. So almost like a winger type Darwin Nunez, if I can say that, at least, you know, with, with regards to the season or a premium Mudrik, if you want to put it like that. As far as Neuer, I'd probably pass up on him if I was on Limitless, but I can understand people going for him as well. Um, I just think that it's not really advisable given that the, the fixture is going to be much tougher here with Switzerland. And, and that's pretty much what it comes down to uh, for the German national team. But Overall, I think if I had to pick three players, if I was on Limitless for Germany, I think I would definitely go middle start. Um, and, and obviously, assuming that Sané is going to be benched, because as I said, I think the starting team will be the exact same as the previous ones um, that we've seen previously. I do think that I would go with Musial and Gundo and middle start, and that would be my triple up for Germany. So thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys have a wonderful time. Best of luck with match day three, and I'll see you guys soon.